At some point in your past, you did something bold that led to success. It was summertime. Warm blue sky, hot humid air. I was 12 years old and going to the swimming pool. The memory is still incredibly vivid in my mind. I walked into the pool with my friend and saw people enjoying the summer, the smell of suntan lotion, and there it was, the high dive. My friend told me he was going off the high dive whether I did or didn't, and I certainly had no intention of going off the high dive that day, yet for some reason that I didn't understand then, I felt compelled to follow him. And I followed him to the board, and I climbed the ladder rung by rung, my pulse racing, my breath shallow. I stepped onto the board, and I looked down. I saw some people looking up at me laughing, wondering what's that boy going to do when he goes off the high dive. I walked to the edge of the board, and I thought to myself, do I go feet first, or do I dive in? I dove in. Sometimes we dip our toes in the water, and sometimes we dive in. These are two ways to get into a swimming pool. On that day, as a young boy, I learned an important life lesson. Overcoming fear of the unknown can make you stronger. I want to share with you my grandfather, who taught me to set goals, to take some risks, to take some leaps off of a high dive. And when I do, think about members of your family, those who live and those who live on in your memories. My grandfather came to America at 16 years of age, all alone. Like many immigrants who came to America in the early 20th century, he came to America believing that America was a land of hope and opportunity, a place where he could find a better life for himself. He had limited education, limited English-speaking skills. But he had a dream of finding a better life, and he had a skill. He knew how to make shoes. That skill, in combination with hard work, determination, setting big goals, taking some leaps, put him on a pathway to success. My grandfather, when he retired, was co-owner of Erica Shoes, a shoe company that made shoes for major department stores across America from the 1960s until the mid-1970s. My grandfather was a self-made man. The diving board at the swimming pool is a metaphor for our lives. We all know people who will leap off of a high dive, or did, like my grandfather, but we also know people who chose to dip their toes in the water instead of taking a leap, and this at times has changed their pathway, their trajectory. So my question to you is, when was the last time that you took a leap off of a high dive? Reflect on why you did it. What was your motivation? What did you want? How did you feel? If you close your eyes, can you recapture those feelings? How can a decisive leap make you a better person, professional, or leader? So how do we bring this mindset into our lives, allowing us to take more risk? You have to take chances. You can't be afraid to fail. If you're a teacher, think of your students. Parents, think of your own children. Children are fearless, daring, much more likely to take risks. As we grow older, we become more cautious, less inclined to take risks. If you're a teacher, those aha moments that students have when they learn something for the first time, or if you're a parent, that moment when your child experiences something for the first time or learns something for the first time, how does that feel? As I've learned from my grandfather, Taking risks is needed to find something new or to go someplace new. Risk allows us to leap off of the high dive. Now, there have been times in my life where I have been far away from the boy who took a leap off of a high dive and much more inclined to dip my toes in the water. I can recall when I was in 11th grade, all of the students in my class had to meet with a high school guidance counselor, and we were to discuss what we wanted to do or be after we graduated high school. And I thought that was going to be an easy, easy conversation. My parents had always talked to me about college. I had every intention to go to college. I figured I would walk into his office, 
and quickly say, I want to go to college. So I walked into his office, and he had a big desk. And in front of that desk, a small chair. And I sat in that chair. And he said, so Evan, what do you want to do after high school? And I said, I want to go to college. And he leaned back in his chair, and he slowly said, Evan, college is not for you. You are simply not college material. You should go to work after high school. Now, there is nothing wrong with going, after, going to work after high school, but it simply was not what I wanted. I planned to go to college. My parents talked to me about going to college. But here's someone who has been in a building for a long time who seems to see me far different than I see myself and certainly than what my parents are communicating to me. So I went home and I talked to my parents and I told them everything and they gave me some good advice and it's some advice that I can share right now. They said, never let, never let anyone get in the way of the hopes and dreams that you have for yourself. Your value doesn't decrease because someone isn't capable of seeing your worth. But I wasn't the only student told that by that man. Other students were told probably quite similar. They may not have had parents to go home to. And his words could have changed their pathway, their trajectory. Does categorizing students still occur in schools? It does. And it's something that we need to reflect on and something that we need to stop. Data is one way that we do it. I can share an example that's not that much different than what I experienced with my guidance counselor. In recent years, I have been in sales meetings where I have heard salespeople say they could predict if a student would graduate high school, go to community college, or attend and graduate a four-year university based off of how they did off of third or fifth grade state standardized test scores in reading. I hope that gives you pause. Data can tell you where a student is, but it cannot tell you what a student can be. Data can tell you where a student is, but it cannot tell you what a student can be. I've had other moments in my life where I have been experiencing moments of fear. With my guidance counselor, it was a fear of being told something that I didn't want to hear. But I've also experienced something that I think of as fear of responsibility. I can recall the night before I walked into a building for the first time as a building level principal. A realization. If student achievement is good, if teachers and students enjoy being in the school, if the community and parents are supportive of the school, it probably has a lot to do with the collaborative leadership that I am bringing into the building, working with teachers, students, parents, to create a culture and a climate for an effective school. I wanted to create a building where teachers, felt empowered and comfortable to take risks. I recall sharing a story with them, a story that I'll share right now. It's a story of three types of teachers, and everyone can relate to these teachers. They each sit in a chair, chair one, chair two, and chair three. Chair one are teachers who you disliked or even hated and you remember their names because we don't forget people who were mean to us. Chair two are teachers who you can't remember because as time moves on, we forget people who don't impact us positively or negatively. They fade away. And chair three are teachers who had a significant and profound impact on your life. Every student in my school and in every school across America deserves that teacher, but we have to ask ourselves, what needs to happen within the building so people feel empowered and encouraged to be that person? Because to be that person, you're going to have to take some leaps. You're going to have to take some risks. Teachers who have a profound impact on kids rarely play it safe 100% of the time. Fear at times has placed me far from the boy who took a leap off of a high dive. Fear changes pathways and trajectories. We have to ask ourselves, how do we remove fear from the decisions that we make and how do we encourage others to do the same? How do we let go of what's holding us back and how do we encourage others to do the same? How do we bring a high dive into our life and bring more boldness to our decisions personally and professionally? 
Sometimes in education, we do things for no real reason other than we've always done it that way. At times, traditions exist in classroom schools and communities. Sometimes, no other reason other than it's always been that way. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is certainly an opportunity to reflect. At times, instructional practices exist in classrooms and schools, again, for no reason other than it's always been that way, not necessarily bad. But if it's born of a belief that it was good enough for me, it's good enough for them, that's not okay. If practices carry on without taking a good look at the research and best practices that help us understand what great teaching is, that's something that we need to take a look at. Sometimes our thinking holds us back, and sometimes our leaders create cultures that hold us back. Just like Linus in the Peanuts cartoon, we cling to a blanket. The blanket is a metaphor for the traditions and practices that we hold on to, that we may need to reflect on, and that we may need to let go of. So what can you let go of to make you a better person, professional, or leader? Our freedom can be found in letting go of any Linus's blankets that we cling to, allowing us to better prepare students for their future and allowing us to grow as professionals. But it can be hard to let go of something you love or to change how you think. But I think back to my grandfather. He let go of his country, his family, his language to find a better life for himself in America. I'd like you to take a moment and imagine, if you will, what a classroom might have looked like 100 years ago. Think back to images that you've seen on your computer. Of course, the classrooms are not in, the images are not in color, they're in black and white. No whiteboards, no computers. But in many classrooms 100 years ago, students are sitting in rows. Teachers are in front of the room. Not that different than many classrooms today. In fact, if my grandfather was somehow magically transported from 100 years ago to today, he might know what to do if he walked into a classroom somewhere in America. He would come in, sit down, and in some cases make sure his mouth was closed until he was told what to do. Now, if you will, think of a factory. What a factory might have looked like 100 years ago. Factories look significantly different 100 years ago than they do now. Part of the reason is the pace of innovation in business drives change, can encourage more creativity, more innovation, staying ahead of the curve, because if business doesn't change, business can go out of business. Now, I'm not making a perfect comparison by any means between business and education, but what I am saying is that we can learn something in education from what drives business. The high dive at the swimming pool represents the boldness that we need to bring into our lives. But taking a leap can be scary. But each time you do it, it gets a little bit easier. When I think about these images and I think of schools, I think about the importance to reflect on traditions and practices and let go of what might be holding us back. In my building, I'm very proud that my staff has worked on reviewing traditions and practices and we continue to study them and let go of things that don't make sense. We let go of averaging grades. Averaging grades exist in schools all across the country, and it's something that I think we need to think about. If a grade is supposed to communicate the culminating, culminating knowledge that a student has of a particular unit, but a student did poorly in the beginning of the unit, then their prior transgression is held against them in the average, and the grade, therefore, doesn't really communicate their learning. We let go of failure without the hope to recover. Because kids quit when they don't have hope, and guess what? Adults do too. We let go of extra credit. From the traditional types of extra credit of adding a few points to a test or quiz with a content-related question, to adding points to a test or quiz with a trivial, non-content-related question, to things like I experience, such as bringing in a box of tissues or paper towels in order to add points to a grade. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I certainly hope that children continue to bring in paper towels and tissues into schools, but it should not communicate their grade, nor should it influence their history grade, as an example. 
my staff continues to look at change and to realize that everything we do is designed to give us exactly what we get. And if we keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, that simply will not lead to effective change. In fact, there is a definition in Webster's Dictionary for that. So what can you let go of? What's a decisive leap that you can take right now because everyone has a leadership role in change? How can you model it? What can you let go of? Our students deserve us to best prepare them for their futures. In order to do that, we may need to evaluate the traditions and practices that exist in American schools, reflect on them, and make changes that are best for children. Trust and relationships are needed to take a leap off of a high dive. Without them, no one is going to take a leap off of a high dive. No one's going to take a leap if they're afraid, if they think they'll be laughed at or mocked at. If you're the leader of a school or a business, what cultural shifts might need to occur in your school or organization to better encourage people to be more bold, to take some risks, to find their personal greatness? Because without taking some leaps, we're not doing the best we can for children. And this is me. I'm a middle school principal who defied the prediction of a high school guidance counselor. Here I am doing what I enjoy most, having conversations with students about their future, a future that we cannot perfectly define, but a future that myself and other educators all across the world need to get students ready for. At some point in your past, you did something bold that led to success. I'd like you to think about that, to reflect on that. Can you inspire others to do the same? Take risks, take chances. Be bold, be daring, be innovative. Because someday, you may find yourself by a swimming pool. And when you do, remember, there are two ways to get into a swimming pool. Take others along with you and let them experience what it's like to take a leap off a high dive.